Dead America, Carolina Front, Book 4. Dead America, The Second Week, Book 7. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 11. And that's how we ended up fighting off 30 insurgents from their own bunker, Captain Terrell Graham was saying as he stabbed a stray zombie in the face with his knife. Corporal Coleman rolled his eyes. Last time you told that story, it was 25, he teased, and his friend shot him a playful glare. So it's the guy who was comfy cozy back at base while we were out fighting our asses off, he countered. Walter and Hoyt shared an amused glance at the soldiers' ribbing of each other. The older you get, the bigger your tails, Hoyt replied, giving his sage wisdom from being the oldest of the group. Walter laughed and shook his head. I knew one or two people as young as me that had tall tails too, sir. Might as well check this row of houses and see if there is anything useful, Terrell said, motioning to the few modest houses on the left side of the street. The town had been pretty much deserted, aside from the occasional zombie here or there. It made for easy scavenging, that was for sure. Their mission was to find steel rebar from the factory in town to help aid their defenses at Clinton, but there would definitely be advantages in collecting whatever they could. They approached the first house, and Coleman banged on the front door to draw out any corpses from inside. There was a shuffle and a thud, the telltale sign of a slow-moving zombie bonking around in the front hall. One lone dude hanging out in there, Coleman reported, peering through the window. Terrell motioned to Walter, pointing to the younger black man's crowbar. You're up, bud. Let's see what you've learned, huh? Walter rolled his shoulders, raising his crowbar as Coleman wrapped his hand around the door handle. The younger man fell into a loose fighting stance, just as the captain had shown him, and then the corporal opened the door. The zombie staggered out onto the front porch, groaning and seeming confused at all of the fresh meat everywhere. Walter took that moment of confusion and lunged forward, driving the pointy end of the crowbar into the thing's eye socket. It dropped immediately, and he thrust his weapon into the air, letting out a victorious holler. Terrell clapped him on the back. Good job, you're definitely getting more confident, he commended. Just don't let it get to your head, right? You get too cocky and that's when you get eaten. How in the hell are you still alive then, Cap? Coleman joked. His friend smacked him playfully as he headed into the house. I get karma points for keeping your ass alive. Walter dragged the zombie out of the way so that Hoyt had a clear path up the stairs into the house. The oldest man wasn't decrepit by any means, but he was definitely a little slower moving than the rest. Walter had worked with their family for so long pre-apocalypse that it was just habit to look out for his well-being. I've got the kitchen. Coleman, do a sweep of the upstairs to make sure we have no more friends roaming around, Terrell instructed. Walter and Hoyt took the rest of the main floor, rummaging through closets for anything useful. The quartet managed to scrounge up a few cans of soup, a box of stale crackers, a first aid kit, and a bottle of wine, and set everything down on the front porch outside. We can pick everything up with the truck on our way out, Coleman said as they headed to the next house. By the time they reached the factory grounds, the row of houses all had little piles of supplies on their front porches. They hadn't wanted to trundle up to the factory with a noisy vehicle, just in case of a horde. So after securing the area, they'd be able to drive around and pick everything up. Down, Terrell hissed, as they approached the fence surrounding the main building. There were quite a few corpses staggering about inside. The other three complied and crouched with him in the bushes off the side of the road. There's a lot of civilian clothes in there, Coleman noticed. Walter's brow furrowed. What does that have to do with anything, he asked. If they were all factory worker uniforms, that would make sense, Terrell explained. But the fact that these zombies all look like regular townsfolk, it almost looks like they were quarantined here on purpose. The younger man nodded. You think somebody put them here maliciously? Not necessarily, Coleman replied. It's possible, but it could just be that this was the only place for the town to put their sick when the outbreak happened. Or they're guarding something, Hoyt piped up. Or that, Coleman agreed. 
Biggest problem is our utter lack of ammunition. He held up his half-empty clip. Terrell nodded, shaking his own. It's abysmal, really. What do we do? Walter asked, eyes wide. There's so many of them. I don't think I'm ready to take on such a huge group with just a crowbar. The captain shook his head and reached into his pack. He produced two homemade gauntlets and strapped them on. They'd been outfitted with sharpened rebar, giving each of his fists a set of three long claws. I got this, he said. You all get them along the fence here, and I'll get them from behind. Coleman grinned. Ten four, Cap. He stood up from the bushes and pulled out a baton from his belt, dragging it across the chain link loudly. Hey, bitches, you want to taste a piece of this? Hoyt rolled his eyes at the soldier's antics. He turned to Terrell as Walter jumped up and down next to the corporal. Be safe, Captain, he said, and then joined Coleman, hooting and shaking the fence to draw attention. Terrell skirted the bushes and headed over to the front gate, unlatching it and letting himself in. He closed it securely behind him to make sure the zombies wouldn't get loose and run rampant in the surrounding area, and then crept towards the staggering dead, taking out a few stragglers easily with rebar to the backs of their heads. Half a dozen zombies wandered out of a bay door from the side of the building and noticed Terrell as opposed to the noise attracting the rest of their brethren. They were a little quicker than their outdoor counterparts and descended on him quickly. The captain ducked, the first zombie toppling over his back face first. He lunged up and stabbed the second in the bottom of its jaw, and then used it as a shield to shove back against the remaining quartet. He tore his claws free and leapt over the fallen corpse, stabbing two struggling zombies on the ground before slashing at ankle level to knock over the last two. As soon as they hit the ground, he stabbed down into their skulls, splattering coagulated brain matter all over the asphalt. The one that had tripped over him managed to get back to its feet, and the captain grinned at it, delivering a ferocious roundhouse kick to the face that caused the zombie's neck to snap brutally, its head dangling down uselessly as the corpse crumpled into a heap. Walter's jaw hung open, his distraction completely stopped from shock. Coleman barked a laugh when he noticed the younger man's awe. Yeah, Cap's a killing machine, the corporal said, as he stabbed a zombie in the forehead through the chain link. You couldn't have asked for a better tutor in the apocalypse. Walter squared his shoulders, stabbing his own corpse through the fence with his crowbar. Pride swelled in him that Terrell had taken him under his wing in the first place. Between the trio stabbing on the safe end and Terrell taking them out from behind, they made quick work of the zombies. When there was nothing left but a pile of rotted flesh inside the fence, the captain grinned at his companions. He waved at them with a bloody claw. Ready to come in? Chapter Two The quartet cleared the factory quickly, finding no more zombies inside. With every inner door open, any that had been wandering around had been drawn outside already and taken out by Terrell's killer claws. The captain removed his gauntlets and shoved them back into his pack, careful to keep them inside the plastic bag he'd lined it with to keep it from getting soggy and bloody. All right, Hoyt and Walter, why don't you head on back and grab the truck, he asked. You can drive it right in through that bay door, and we'll load up whatever we find in here. Got it. Hoyt replied, and he led his young friend back outside into the sunlight. Coleman emerged from the lunchroom with a bag of spicy cheese puffs. Jackpot. There wasn't any water, but fuck, I missed these. He cracked open the bag and held it out to his friend, but Terrell shook his head. All yours, man, he replied, wrinkling his nose at the smell. I'm pretty sure those survived because they're not actually food. Is there even nutritional value in there? Coleman winked at him. Nutritional value for my soul. He popped a salty treat into his mouth and moaned as it made contact with his tongue. You're disgusting, Terrell laughed and headed over to a stack of skids in the far corner. He lifted the corner of some plastic covering one of the pallets. Now that's a jackpot. 
He pulled the plastic back, revealing stacks of rebar. Coleman munched on his snack as he wandered over to an open truck parked nearby. Hey, he called through a mouthful of fake cheese. What does this look like to you? Terrell turned and approached, raising an eyebrow at the machinery inside. Looks like a big ass still. We can make some killer moonshine with this, Coleman said with a grin. Terrell rolled his eyes. Or we could use it for something useful. The corporal emptied the last of his salty snacks into his mouth, crumpling up the empty bag and tossing it back over his shoulder. Explosives? he asked. Explosives, the captain confirmed. If we filled it with something like fertilizer, maybe. Could be handy south of Fayetteville. Coleman nodded. I'll get this truck running. He headed for the driver's side door to take a look at the key situation. There was a rumble as Hoyt pulled up with their vehicle and backed right up to him as he waved them over. He and Walter jumped down, walking back and noticing the still. Whoa, that's one hell of a rig, the older man said. Terrell grinned. You ever use one of those? Back in the day, Hoyt admitted. Walter raised an eyebrow. I learn something new about you every day. He shook his head and headed off to find a pump cart or a forklift to move the pallets up into the back of the trucks, and Terrell clapped Hoyt on the shoulder. Coleman jumped down from the driver's seat, shaking his head as he wandered back over to them. I'm gonna have to hotwire it unless we can find a... He stopped talking at the sound of a revving engine from outside. Terrell immediately strode to the bay doors, Coleman and Hoyt drawing their weapons and flanking him. The captain peered outside as an unknown truck skidded to a stop. The driver narrowed his eyes at them, and both he and his passenger cocked their large guns before pointing them through the window. Chapter 3 Hoyt cocked his shotgun and pointed it at the two men as they got out of their vehicle, their own guns poised. Oh, hey, Miles, Terrell greeted leaving his weapon slung over his shoulder and raising his hands. He'd come across this guy before, a member of another nearby town, though he hesitated to think of it as a rival camp. I think we can lower our weapons now. That's a mighty big shotgun, bud, Miles replied, his steel eyes warily fixed on Hoyt. But he cocked his head and lowered his weapon, holding up a hand to his partner to do the same. His partner complied, though with a deep scowl on his face. What are you here for? He demanded, jutting out his chin. Hoyt, it's okay, Terrell said, lowering his hands. The older man reluctantly pointed his gun at the ground, but kept his finger on the trigger. We were just in the neighborhood for some rebar, Terrell explained. We're looking to beef up our walls in Clinton to keep the zombies out. Miles nodded. Yeah, we hear that. We came on down here to look for some rebar ourselves to fortify our front gate. He motioned over his shoulder with his thumb. We thought we'd hit some of the houses in town too, unless you've already picked through them. We went through a few of the smaller ones on the left side of the street over that way, Terrell replied, pointing to the row of houses they'd cleaned out. We didn't find much, but if there's something specific you're looking for, maybe we could spare some. Or we could just fucking crush you and take it. Miles' partner snarled, prompting Hoyt to raise the gun again. Mario? Miles scolded, turning to his companion. That's not how we talk to people we have a truce with. Terrell held out his hand to Hoyt, prompting him to lower his weapon again. The older man wrinkled his nose and shook his head at the captain, showing his distaste for the situation. If we really had a truce, they'd give us half of all the shit they found today. Mario spat. Says who? Miles hissed. Stop being a dick for five seconds so we can talk like real men, huh? Terrell took a step forward. Look, I know supplies are tight, he said. It's rough for everyone everywhere. I'm not 100% privy to whatever deal our camp has with yours, but I don't think any of us are high enough up the chain of command to be making calls without our leaders present, right? Agreed, Miles said with a smile. He stepped towards the captain, hand extended. I don't know if we formally met. I'm Miles. Terrell raised an eyebrow as he shook the young man's hand, noticing the outline of dog tags beneath his tank top. Captain Terrell Graham, 
What's your rank, soldier? Miles chuckled and ran a hand over his buzzed hair. No rank anymore, Cap, he replied, gently patting his tags through his shirt. I was a private first class, but got discharged on medical when an IED went off too close to me. He tapped his left ear. Left me deaf in one ear and with a brand spanking new titanium knee. That's rough, Terrell replied, shaking his head. At least you got to keep the leg, though. Miles nodded. I'm definitely thankful for that, given the state of things. I haven't met any survivors in wheelchairs or on crutches for a reason, I think. He turned away from Mario completely, looking the captain in the eye. Listen, we don't want to cause any shit, but we could really use some rebar for our door. And the boss will come down hard on my face if I don't bring some back. Terrell took a deep breath. Since you're doing a door and we're doing our walls, would you be okay with one pallet? Or however much fits in the back of your pickup? Yeah, yeah, man, Miles replied, nodding emphatically. That would be rad, as long as it's cool with your partners, of course. Coleman narrowed his eyes, but didn't say anything. Hoyt kept his gun pointed at the ground, his eyes suspiciously on Mario. Walter had liberated a pump cart from the back, and upon listening to the conversation, approached the captain with a pallet in tow. All cool, the young man said with a smile. Miles nodded at him gratefully. Teamwork at its finest, he replied. Mario, get this loaded up. His partner didn't reply, but his scowl deepened even further as he approached the group. He grabbed the handle of the pump cart and pulled the throttle so he could pull the pallet behind him, nearly taking out Hoyt on his way by. He grumbled something under his breath, and Miles rolled his eyes. Sorry about him, he said. I appreciate this. Terrell shrugged. We do what we have to do these days. They say you can choose your friends, but that's not always true when it comes to surviving the apocalypse. True, my friend, Miles replied with a laugh. Mario trundled back over with the pump cart and practically shoved it back at Walter, who gave him a sarcastic salute and headed off to deal with the rest of the pallets. Well, are we getting the fuck out of here or what? Mario demanded. Miles sighed. Yeah, man. He held out his hand for Terrell to shake again and offered a smile. Thanks again. The captain shook, schooling his expression when he felt a piece of paper forced between his fingers. No problem. The men walked back to their truck, Mario glancing suspiciously over his shoulder a few times at Hoyt, who just smiled sweetly back at him. Once the truck was out of sight, Coleman let out a low whistle. Well, that guy was a winner he declared, sarcasm evident in his tone. Terrell opened his hand, unfolding the piece of paper that Miles had snuck him. Miles is okay. I meant the other douchebag, Coleman replied. What's that? The captain shook his head. Not sure. He gave it to me when we shook hands and clearly didn't want Mario to see. Hoyt approached, resting his shotgun on his shoulder. Found military-grade weapons at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Terrell read out loud, brow furrowing. Isn't that just in Goldsboro to the northwest? There is no way that isn't a trap, Coleman said immediately. Why would he just happen to have that written on a piece of paper, ready to slip it to you? There's no way that is legit. Terrell shrugged. Either way, we're gonna go run it by Xavier first. We need to get these supplies back home. Military-grade weapons, huh? Hoyt said as they walked back towards their trucks. We could really use the ammo. Terrell nodded with a wink. Would save you from having to use that shotgun as a fancy club. Chapter Four As the quartet rolled back into town with the two big trucks, Terrell pulled his over at the front gate. The cluster of workers there were ready and waiting for the rebar and grinned with excitement at the big hall. Run into any trouble? One of the older men asked, but the captain just clapped him on the shoulder. Nothing we couldn't handle, my man, he replied with a grin and received a thumbs up in return. He and Coleman strolled through the gates after Walter and Hoyt drove the other truck inside that housed the still and other supplies they'd grabbed from the houses. Xavier met them outside of the main hall and waved with a bright smile. Terrell returned it, unable to resist the optimism always oozing from the leader of Clinton. 
Every time they returned from a run, he was always happy for their safe return. That day, the man in question wore a pristine light green plaid suit, a nice contrast to his dark skin in the sunlight. I don't know if I'll ever get used to your vast wardrobe, the captain said by way of greeting, as he extended a hand to Xavier. He chuckled and shook first Terrell's, then Coleman's hand. I never would have gotten to wear this kind of thing in my past life, he said cheerfully. We make the most of what we can. Come inside. The ladies will bring you a nice late lunch. Yum, Coleman chirped. Terrell motioned over his shoulder as they walked in the front door. The guard towers look like they're taking shape pretty well. Yes, thanks to your input, our defenses are really coming together, Xavier said. He led them to a conference table in the corner, where the sweet elderly Ruth was pouring a few steaming mugs of coffee. Coleman put a hand over his heart. Ruth, my love, you always know exactly what I need. Sit down, young man, she replied gently, giving him a wink as she wandered off with the empty coffee pot. June arrived with two bowls of maple and sweet potato soup with fresh baked buns, and the two soldiers practically salivated as they took their seats. Thank you, ma'am, Terrell said politely, and June patted them both on the shoulders before heading off. So, how did it go? I see you came back with an extra truck, Xavier commented as he sat down at the head of the table, taking up his coffee mug. Terrell stirred his soup to cool it down before eating it. We secured three pallets of rebar and some other food and supplies from some of the houses. The extra truck has a large still in it, which we figured would be useful as an explosive for defense purposes. Good find, Xavier agreed. Terrell blew gently on his soup before continuing. We also ran into Miles. Ah, young Miles, the older man replied, shaking his head. How did that go? His partner was ready to fight, but Miles talked him down, Terrell replied. He also slipped me this. He slid the note across the table and then took a few tentative sips of his soup. Coleman pushed his already empty bowl away from him and leaned back in his chair with his coffee mug. It's a trap for sure, he said, wiping the orange mustache from his top lip. We don't know that, Terrell countered. Xavier shook his head. It is suspicious. Of course it is, the captain agreed. I never said it wasn't, but the pull of possible ammo, I think it's worth the risk. Coleman shook his head. It's not. They're just trying to draw us out and leave the town defenseless so they can come and take it for themselves. Terrell shrugged. And if it is a trap and we don't go, they'll be able to take the whole town because they'll have a huge cache of military-grade weapons at their disposal. So we should risk it because they might be stronger than us? Coleman countered. The captain shook his head. No, we should risk it because we might be able to load up on ammo and weapons. Xavier clucked his tongue to get their attention. I don't like the thought of leaving us defenseless, but I agree with the captain, he said. I think it's worth it to at least check it out, see what we can see. If just the two of us go, we can stay incognito and quiet, Terrell replied. Coleman opened his mouth to protest, and then closed it again, taking a sip of his coffee. That's a good idea, Xavier agreed. If you're both up to it, we'd be forever grateful. The corporal smacked Terrell on the back as he downed the last of his coffee. What are you waiting for, Cap? Hurry up and eat your lunch. Chapter 5 Well, this is unpleasant. Coleman said brightly as he made a makeshift couch out of garbage bags. Terrell climbed up into the waste truck behind him and flopped into the bags. Could be worse. They could have run out of garbage bags. Always looking on the bright side of life, Cap, the corporal replied, lounging on his new cushy love seat. Be safe, gentlemen, Xavier said to them with a nod, and both soldiers waved at him before Hoyt closed the back of the truck. He and Walter would be the ones doing the dump run, just like they always did every week. This way, they'd be avoiding doing anything out of the ordinary, and if anyone was watching, they wouldn't know that Terrell and Coleman had left. Just an old dude and his friend taking out the trash. The walkie-talkie in Terrell's pocket beeped, and he fished it out. We've got a shadow, gents. Sit tight, Hoyt reported. The captain sighed. Ten-four, keep us posted. 
Sit tight, Coleman asked. Where would we go? Eventually they're gonna have to dump us. As if on cue, Hoyt came in. We're going to have to dump you. Great, the corporal chirped. Terrell chuckled. 10-4, he said, and stuffed the radio back into his pocket. We're gonna have to burrow in so we're not seen. Lovely, Coleman replied, and began to wriggle his way underneath the couch he'd made. Terrell shimmied in between a bunch of the garbage bags. Thankfully, the smell wasn't too bad, considering all of the perishable, biodegradable stuff went towards compost for gardening. They buried themselves as best they could and waited for the truck to back up. The telltale bleep, bleep, bleep of the truck precluded the hydraulics lifting, and the soldiers grasped the garbage bags around them to make sure they had a quiet, hidden, soft landing. They tumbled out, being buried in bags, and stayed put as the truck righted itself and headed off away from the dump. A few tense minutes later, the walkie-talkie beeped. They're following us, Hoyt came in. Not sure if there is anyone surveilling the dump, but we've drawn the attention of our shadow at least. Terrell brought the radio to his mouth. 10-4, we'll wait a little bit and see what's up. Thanks for the ride. Be safe, Hoyt replied. Coleman sighed, surprising the captain with how close their heads had landed next to each other. How long is a little bit, Cap? I don't know what's digging into my back, but it's unpleasant. Unpleasant is better than dead, Terrell replied, but didn't wait terribly long before gingerly pushing his way to the surface. He stayed as low as he could, peering through cracks between bags, surveying the surrounding area. The dump seemed quiet. We good? Coleman asked. Terrell wriggled his way up through the bags. We're clear, he confirmed. The corporal leapt up out of the bags, like a whale breaching the ocean, gasping for air dramatically. Ha, ah, thank fuck, he declared, quickly running down the little hill of trash to the dirt below. Terrell shook his head and followed, readying his weapon just in case there was a trap waiting for them. But it seemed that the dump was deserted. They headed through the mountains of garbage, running around to the back of the dump to the back entrance. There was a lone zombie outside of the chain link door, and Coleman quickly dispatched it with his knife. They ducked outside, guns pointing this way and that, to make sure they didn't have company. Clear, Terrell confirmed, and they relaxed as they headed across the dirt road to a walking trail. The car should be just up in the bushes on the other side of this hill. Coleman chuckled. Should be, he teased. I know there's plenty of people around that could have stolen it, but now I'm imagining zombies taking a joyride. Thank fuck they aren't that smart, Terrell replied, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. People are hard enough to deal with, let alone zombies that can drive. The corporal stretched his arms above his head as they walked and cracked his neck from side to side. Have you wondered why they're not smart, though? I mean, I guess when you die, your brain stops working. And since it's decomposing with the rest of you, I guess you lose whatever intelligence you had. I really don't want to imagine smart zombies, Terrell replied. Coleman shrugged. But if they were smart, they might not want to eat us, you know? If they still retain their memories? That would be almost worse, though, the captain shivered. Imagine dying and then coming back to life as a rotting corpse. If they did keep all of their memories and personalities, they'd have to deal with being zombies. Worse for them, better for us, though, Coleman shrugged. At least we wouldn't have to kill them. Yeah, because we haven't had to kill any humans with memories and personalities in this apocalypse, Terrell shot back, sarcasm evident in his voice. The corporal paused and then nodded. Point taken. They headed through a copse of trees and found the little sedan buried in branches that a few of the Clinton men had planted there in case a covert vehicle was needed. This was definitely one of those times. The keys were in the ignition, ready and waiting, and the soldiers got comfy in the leather seats as Terrell started the car. This is actually pretty nice, Coleman said, running his hand along the dashboard. The captain revved the engine and grinned. You can enjoy it for the next 40 miles to Goldsboro. Chapter 6 the soldiers stashed the car in some bushes, making their way covertly to the Air Force base. Okay, let's see what we can see, 
Coleman grunted as he climbed up a dense tree, scoped rifle slung over his shoulder. Terrell followed him up so they could continue to talk as the corporal got the lay of the land. What building did the note say? You won't be able to see it from here, the captain replied. Interior building four, room 367. It's going to take some hunting to find the right door in there. So sketchy, Coleman replied, shaking his head as he perched on a thick branch, bracing his foot into a knot on the trunk. He got comfortable and held up his rifle, using the scope to have a look around the base. Terrell stayed standing, feet on one branch as he leaned on a higher one, crossing his arms. Maybe it's a storage room? It would make sense to hide the weapons somewhere, as opposed to just leaving them all lying around for anyone to find. Or it's a trap, Coleman shot back, but there was no venom in his voice. They'd had this argument already, and he'd lost, and that was that. The door to the armory is hanging open, so it's definitely been cleaned out. What else do you see? Terrell asked. The corporal pursed his lips as he surveyed the runway. No planes left, except for one crashed at the end of the runway. There's no movement over there either. So either the corpses were obliterated in the crash, or they're wandering around somewhere else. It's hard to get a handle on any of that, with us being almost two weeks into the apocalypse, Terrell mused. Coleman lowered his gun for a moment, brow furrowed. Hell, it has been almost two weeks, hasn't it? He shook his head, almost in disbelief. Is it weird that it feels like no time at all, but also kind of like forever? Like it's the new normal, the captain suggested. Yeah, it is weird, but I get it. I think it's just because we have to adapt or we die. So scoping out Air Force bases for weapon caches and potential traps is just our lives now, buddy. His companion rolled his eyes. Wonderful, he replied, sarcasm evident in his tone. He raised the scope to his eye again. I can't really see much of the buildings from here, but at least I can cover all of the incoming roads. I don't know if there's going to be a better spot than this if you still want me to stay on the outskirts for sniping. I do, Terrell confirmed. I'll leave you to your tree, then. How's your ammo? Coleman inclined his head to the rifle on the captain's back. Zero, came the reply. So make sure your shots count, because I have no extra for you until I get back. He tightened the strap on his rifle that would be useless unless he found a big box of bullets inside, and began the climb down. Be safe, Coleman hissed, and Terrell gave him a thumbs up as he hit the ground. He pulled out a set of heavy-duty wire cutters and set to clipping a hole in the chain-link fence so he could slip through. He pulled his handgun, the only weapon he had that still had any ammo, and ducked through the hole. First, Terrell jogged across the asphalt towards the fallen plane, inspecting the rubble. One of the engine intakes was completely caked with crimson, and he wrinkled his nose at the thought of someone getting sucked inside and liquefied by the blades. The saving grace was that it was probably a zombie that had wandered too close while the thing was still running. He poked his head inside the cab, where there was one slightly shifting charred corpse. It was so burnt that it didn't even have a working mouth anymore its charred skin flaking off with each little wriggle. Terrell drew his knife and leaned in the window, stabbing it in the head to put it out of its misery, if the thing even knew misery. The captain stood up, taking a deep breath as he glanced around. He raised his radio to his lips. There's nothing out here, he said, neither alive or dead. It's really quiet. He turned the volume far down just in case. Coleman crackled through. It's creeping me out, Cap. I hate to admit it, but me too, Terrell admitted. I want to think that this is karma finally on our side, but even no zombies wandering around? Something feels off. You want to get out of there? Coleman asked, though his tone betrayed that he knew that wasn't going to happen. The captain shook his head. Nope, he replied, popping the pee. If there's even a chance the cash is here, I have to risk it. He continued to explore, wandering the quiet base as he made his way to the building in question. There were a few headless corpses strewn about by the front doors, blood splatters long dried. He'd be willing to guess it was from the first week, maybe even the first day. The corpses were long rotten. 
Would you rather get eaten by a zombie or have to eat part of a zombie? Coleman asked, and Terrell chuckled under his breath. They'd played this game a lot over the years, to pass the time when they were out waiting for battles. He tapped on the door of Building 4, waiting for noise inside. None came, and he entered cautiously, swinging his gun around before relaxing. How old is the zombie? He asked into the radio, as he found a stairwell up to the third floor. Coleman laughed back. That makes a difference? Yeah, I mean, if I'm going to die or have to eat rotting flesh, I want to know just how rotten it is, Terrell replied. That's disgusting. The captain cocked a brow. Are you saying you'd get eaten? There was a pause. You know, I think you're right. It does matter how rotten it is. See, Terrell replied, shaking his head as he reached the top of the stairwell. He tapped on it again, waiting for movement, and pursed his lips. This would be the game changer. Entering the third floor, he said, and clipped the radio to his belt. Fingers crossed, Coleman replied. Terrell pushed the door open and slowly made his way down the dim corridor. He could have sworn he heard movement, but when he froze and strained his ears, there was nothing. He kept his handgun at the ready, just in case, and checked the door numbers as he went. There you are, he murmured to himself as he came upon room 367. He gently turned the knob, but there was a padlock holding the whole thing shut, so he got to work with his lock-picking gear. Soon the large lock hit the floor, and he returned the kit to his pocket. Knowing that it might be locked for sinister reasons, Terrell drew his gun again before inching the door open. He peered inside the large storage room, stepping in slowly. The shelves were bare in the dim light. His heart sank. He'd been misled. He hadn't realized how big of a part of him had been hopeful for the break until this moment, when there was nothing here for him. He turned, and then a blinding emergency light blared into his face, burning his retinas. There were a few gunshots until a familiar voice cried, Hold your fire! Terrell squinted, turning to the source of the noise. He clenched his jaw when he realized it was Miles. Chapter 7 Give me one good reason not to shoot your ass right now, Terrell snarled aiming his handgun directly at Miles' face. The man in question stood before him, hands in the air, nowhere near his weapons. Everyone hold your fire, he demanded of his men again. Captain Graham, come on, you know me at this point. I really fucking don't, Terrell replied, still aiming. Just because we've run into each other a few times out there in the wasteland doesn't mean I can trust you. Miles shook his head. No, but you've done me a solid a few times, and our communities have a truce, so I know that I can trust you. That's the problem, though, isn't it? The captain shot back, raising an eyebrow. You knew you could trust me, trust that I would follow your suspicious note, even though I was smart enough to question it. His opponent nodded. I know what it looked like, man, me showing up with it ready like that, he admitted. We knew you were there when we came up. It took me a good while to convince Mario not to snipe you all while you were raiding houses in town. I scribbled the note while he was busy scouting you guys, and then convinced him that we should just have a talk, man to man. Mario scowled from behind him, and Terrell sneered. The guy in question was standing right there, and Miles expected him to trust them both? Or that's what you wanted me to think, he replied, narrowing his eyes. Do the whole good soldier, bad mercenary routine to make me think that you were sneaking around on him. Oh, he was sneaking around on me, Mario muttered, eyes darkening. Terrell squared his shoulders. And why are you here now? Because some of us have a sense of fucking loyalty, Mario snapped. I'm loyal to Miles. The captain rolled his eyes. I find that hard to believe. You didn't seem too warm and fuzzy about him warming up to me at all. Did you notice I'm fucking locked in here too? Mario growled. Miles raised his hands to try to defuse the situation. You don't have to believe me, he said. I know how it looks, but if you don't lower your gun and chill, eventually one of my men is going to pop one in your face. And regardless of what you think right now, I really don't want that to happen, truly. If I'm going down, it's worth it for me to smoke you for leading me into a trap, the captain snapped. His opponent groaned. 
It's not a trap. Did you notice the door was locked? We were stuck in here, man. We had this room stacked to the ceiling with weapons and ammo, and it was all ready to go. Why would you give me the location? Terrell shot back. Why tell me where it is in the first place? If you were going to share weapons with me, why not drop off a box as a peace offering, instead of slipping me a mysterious note? Miles took a deep breath. The note was my peace offering. There are too many of us that were planning on defecting to Clinton. If we were to take off with a bunch of supplies and guns, it would have attracted too much attention. Why the fuck are you here then, attracting all this attention? Terrell asked. His opponent shrugged. Shit's obviously gone tits up, hasn't it? He clenched his jaw for a moment, eyes wide and pleading. Look, every man in this room wanted to pledge themselves to Xavier and Clinton. We were hoping that you guys would get all this stuff out of here so I could lead a mission to take it all back, and then defect. The captain took a deep breath and finally lowered his gun, though he kept one eye on Mario. That is a stupid plan. In hindsight, not my best work, Miles admitted sheepishly, lowering his hands. There was the sound of shuffling all around the room as his men relaxed, taking their weapons off of the captain. So how did you end up locked in here? Terrell asked, waving his hand around his head. Miles shrugged. Well, the boss found out about the betrayal, clearly. The boss? Terrell raised an eyebrow. Like Springsteen? Miles wrinkled his nose. Nah, more like Boss Hogg. Shame we don't have Daisy Duke here, the captain quipped. Miles snorted. No shit, he agreed, and took a deep breath. Anyway, he found out what was going on somehow, left us here, presumably to die and eat each other. Not the nicest boss, Terrell replied, shaking his head. But his loss is our gain, I guess. We may not have the weapons, but we can always use more manpower. I suggest we get out of Dodge and get you boys to Clinton. He eyed Mario, with some rigid ground rules. His new companion smiled. Thanks, Captain, he replied. We really would have been fucked if you hadn't come along. How many of there are you, six? Terrell asked as he surveyed the group. It's gonna be a tight squeeze in the little car we've got. Maybe we can find something to hotwire on the way. Miles shrugged as they followed two of his companions towards the door. A tight squeeze in a car is still preferable to dying of thirst in this shithole. One of the guys nodded emphatically as he opened the door and stepped out into the hallway. What kind of car is- he began, but his question cut off abruptly as a bullet tore through his forehead. Chapter 8 What the fuck? Miles cried. Jacob, Vince, fall back. Phil, you okay? The guy behind the shot man ducked around the door, nodding despite the blood splattered across his face. His mouth was set in a thin line as he stared down at his fallen comrade. There was a crackle from behind Terrell, and he turned. On one of the shelves lay a nondescript walkie-talkie, and it clicked to life. Get a good show, pretties, a snake-like voice hissed through the receiver. Miles' eyes widened. He didn't leave. He clenched his jaw. I guess that's your boss hog, huh? Terrell raised an eyebrow, motioning to the radio. Miles simply nodded. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Vince rambled, running his hands through his hair. We're fucked. Jacob put a hand on his shoulder. Bro, we were gonna die in here all slow like. If we're gonna die getting shot in the head, that's much better. None of us are dying today, Terrell declared, and picked up the radio, raising it to his lips. This is Captain Terrell Graham. Who am I speaking with? The boss opened his end of the line just to laugh, a long, drawn-out noise that had the soldier's eyes rolling. I know who you are, Captain Terrell Graham, he replied. You've caused me a shitload of trouble, instilling traitorous tendencies in my otherwise loyal men. Miles wrinkled his nose. Terrell shrugged. If they were really that loyal, they wouldn't have been susceptible to my traitorous aura. I think your men realized that they could get a better deal somewhere else. Oh, Captain, the boss replied and clucked his tongue. You don't have any idea what kind of deal I offer, what kind of ship I run. And the only alternative for you and Miles and that sorry lot is death. Terrell shook his head. See, I don't think so, he replied. 
I think you got a lucky shot because we weren't aware of what was going on. If you weren't such a pussy, you'd be coming in here and taking me on yourself. Your juvenile attempts to goad me aren't going to work, Captain. The boss came back in a sing-song voice. I wouldn't want to ruin my fun. How about you lead your band of merry shits across the hall into the room with a view, hmm? Vince paled, glancing from his companions to the door. Terrell pursed his lips. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna be following your orders, he replied into the radio. We're not gonna just walk out to get shot in the head. Oh, don't worry, I offed Roy just to surprise you, the boss purred. Like I said, I don't want to ruin my fun. I'd love for you boys to see what I have in store for you, and you can't do that from a windowless room. Miles shook his head. I don't like this. I don't know if we have a choice, Terrell replied to the men in the room, not pushing the radio button. I assume that you all tried to get out of here, and the only way is through that door. We could wait him out, Jacob suggested. Eventually, he'd have to send somebody in here, and we can fight them on our own terms. Miles shook his head. As much as that theory is tempting, if I know the boss, he's got something up his sleeve. Regardless of whether we stay in this room or not, he's going to execute whatever thing he's got going on. And honestly, it might help us if we can see what it is before it comes. Terrell nodded thoughtfully. He trusted Miles' assumption, as it matched his own gut feeling on the matter. They had to take their chance and head across the hall. He realized in all of the hubbub that he'd been ignoring his own radio, and he flicked the volume back up, immediately hearing Coleman's concerned voice. If you don't answer me right now, you asshole Graham. Terrell raised the receiver to his lips. Here, Coleman, he said. Sorry, I had you turned down too far. What was that shot, Captain? Coleman asked quickly, relief evident in his voice. I can't see from this side. We're pinned down by Miles' boss, Terrell replied. The corporal grunted. I fucking knew it. Wait, we? Miles and a few of his guys. They've defected and now we're all in deep shit, the captain explained. Can you see anything? I'm getting impatient, the boss's voice came through the other radio. Nothing on this side, Coleman said. Do you want me to move? We're going to go to the room across the hall, Terrell said. I'll get a look at what's going on and get you to go around to where I think the shot originated from. He raised the boss's radio to his mouth. We're crossing now. Phil stepped away from the wall and tightened his hands around his assault rifle. I'll go first, he offered, and before anyone could protest, he barreled across the hallway and pushed through the door across the way. There were no shots, and nothing exploded. Clear, Phil called back, sweeping the room quickly. Terrell swiftly headed across, leading the other four men into the brightly lit room. The whole outer wall was floor-to-ceiling windows overlooking the side parking lot. Oh, here comes my shipment, the boss taunted through the radio, and six garbage trucks trundled out from a dirt road in the trees, smashing through the gate and onto the grounds. Are you seeing these trucks? Coleman demanded. Terrell clenched his jaw as they surrounded the building, backing up with simultaneous loud beeps. Yep, he replied to his friend and then the trucks began to tilt. The back doors opened, and it wasn't garbage that tumbled out of the dumps. It was zombies. And you don't want to be bad hosts, not letting in your friends. The boss came through, glee in his voice. On cue, an explosion racked the building. What the fuck was that? Vince cried. Miles gripped his gun with white knuckles. Stairwell, he said and Jacob and Phil darted off to secure the stairwell door and hopefully keep them safe on their floor, at least for a little while. Well, I'm off, the boss said. I'm going to take my new weapons and outfit my army to decimate Xavier and take Clinton. Some of my friends are going to stick around, though, so you might want to stay away from the windows. Toodles. Chapter 9 Motherfucker, Terrell muttered under his breath. Cap, Coleman prompted. The whole building is swarming with zombies. The captain sighed and lifted his radio to his lips. I'm aware. What are we gonna do? Vince demanded. 
How are we going to get out of here? Miles put a hand on his shoulder. Why don't you and Phil check out some of the other rooms and see if there's anything we can use? We don't have tons of ammo. Terrell crouched down and pressed himself against the wall next to the window, peering out carefully. I think I know where the shot came from, he said into the radio, honing in on a busted window frame across from the glass that had shattered when Roy was shot. What would you think about heading around there to have a look? If that's where more snipers are, then we should be able to run around them or figure out a route from the other side. Or I could take them out and you can get out whenever you damn please, Coleman chirped back. Miles snorted. I like this guy. Don't take any unnecessary risks, Terrell replied firmly. I need you to stay hidden and figure out where our enemies are. 10-4, Coleman replied. Climbing down my tree now. Smart, having a sniper outside, Miles said. Terrell shrugged, eyeing Mario. He trusted this mission far less than I did. Like I said, smart, his tentative companion replied. So, what's the plan? The captain motioned for them to follow him into the storeroom, where the others had congregated to stay away from the windows. Phil dragged Roy's body into the corner to get him out of the way, and Terrell assumed, out of respect for the fallen man, not to be trampled every time they passed him. How well do you know these buildings? Is there roof access? He asked, as they made a rough semicircle in the room. Miles shook his head. Not on this building. Only two have helipads. This one has an observatory, so there's no hatch to the outside. Terrell crossed his arms. What if we can draw all of the zombies up here and then climb down through a second floor window? Are you insane? Mario snapped, throwing his arms up. Miles waved off his angry companion. That's as good a plan as any. As if on cue, the stairwell door began to rattle with the force of hands and dead bodies smacking into it considering the stairwell is off limits now. We just need to figure out where it's safe to climb down, Terrell mused. He poked his head out of the hallway and looked down to the window that had exploded from Roy's death shot. Did you guys find anything in any of the other rooms? Vince shook his head, and Phil shrugged. Nothing out of the ordinary, the latter replied. Just more busted shit. What about that room at the back, opposite that window? Terrell motioned to the hallway. If we're facing away from the shooter, we might have a better chance. Miles shook his head. He might have more shooters. We need to take out all of the snipers before we make a move. How the fuck are we gonna do that? Mario huffed, crossing his arms. We help Coleman, Terrell replied, turning to Phil. Was there any shiny, broken shit in those rooms? The man shrugged. Lots of glass. One of the rooms had a one-way mirror. What do you need something shiny for? Miles asked. Terrell grinned. Snipers can't hit what they can't see. Chapter 10 Coleman pressed himself up against the corner of the building adjacent to the one Terrell had directed him to. He wanted a clear shot to take out whoever it was that had them pinned down. He figured the best course of action was to play to his strengths and hopefully take them by surprise. He tested the door handle for the fire door, and once figuring out it was unlocked, he knocked on it. There was no movement from inside, so he slipped in quickly and found himself in a stairwell. Perfect. The compound had been wide open and empty when they'd approached, so he was banking on the fact that all the zombies had been rounded up for the boss's plan to be dumped back into the other building. He headed up to the third floor and repeated his knocking up there, just to be safe. As the corporal pushed open the door, he cried out as a snarling zombie launched itself at him. He cursed himself for not having waited long enough after knocking, pushing up with his rifle to keep the thing's snapping mouth at bay. As he hit the floor with a thud, he struggled to take in air and planted his foot into the zombie's stomach, throwing it over his head. The corpse tumbled down the stairs like a rag doll, flailing its limbs and unable to figure out which way was up. Coleman gasped for breath and flipped over onto his stomach as the zombie continued to roll down the stairwell. He shoved his rifle aside and drew his knife, scrambling to his feet and heading down to the next landing. The zombie shrieked and clambered up the stairs towards him on its hands and knees like a rotted gorilla. 
Coleman widened his stance and then stabbed down at the right moment, catching it in the back of the skull. He kicked the corpse down the stairs and into the corner of the landing so that he wouldn't trip if he had to make a hasty retreat. He slung his rifle back over his shoulder and held up his knife, heart rate finally settling a little as he knocked on the door louder this time. He waited as long as he dared. He knew that Terrell needed him, and then eased the door open slowly. Nothing came at him. It must have been a fluke straggler, that one guy that had been caught behind a desk when the rest were rounded up. Poor bastard. Coleman did a quick sweep of the offices, the whole side of the building he needed, a wide open conference room. The table was intact, though the chairs were strewn everywhere, blood splatters on the windows. They were tinted, which suited him just fine, so he could see what he was doing without drawing attention to himself. He surveyed the myriad of broken windows in the building facing Terrell, noting a skywalk from his floor across. That could be handy for him to quickly get across, as long as everything was unlocked. He raised his scope to his eye. Where are you, motherfucker? Chapter 11 Terrell and Phil took up positions on either side of the window, facing the building with the snipers. Miles stood in the hallway at the far end, just inside the room that the other three were using to get themselves down to the second floor. The captain tightened the strip of denim around his palm before gripping the edge of the one-way mirror they'd liberated from the office. Okay, ready? He asked, and Phil nodded, taking the other side. Terrell lifted his radio to his mouth. In position, Coleman, he said. 10-4, Captain, go ahead, the corporal replied. The duo lifted the glass, and before they could even prop it up in the window frame, it shattered following two cracks. Fuck me, there are two of them, Phil breathed, staring down at the two little pieces of glass left in his hands. Terrell nodded and pressed himself against the wall, and then at the sound of another bullet, peeked around the frame to see a body fall out of a window across the way. There were more cracks, but they were aimed at the building alongside into a line of windows. Go, the captain cried, and he and Phil ran down the hallway. Miles ducked into the office, waving to Jacob, who stood next to a busted window, holding thick rope around his waist as he braced himself against the wall. Terrell grabbed the stairwell door as Phil tore into the office and jerked it open, diving inside as Phil slammed the office door behind him. Zombies poured into the hallway, and they shoved a desk against the flimsy door before running for the window. Mario and Vince are already down, go, go, Jacob urged, and Miles swung out over the ledge and slid down the rope. Phil followed, and Terrell clapped Jacob on the shoulder before heading down himself. What the ever-loving fuck, man? Phil was screaming as the captain hit the floor. He caught the rope and pulled it in, dropping it to the floor before hanging out the window again. Jacob hung from the sill on the floor above, but before he could drop down, a bullet hit him in the back, flesh tearing away and causing his body to plummet to the ground. The window frame exploded, and Terrell threw himself into Miles, slamming them both to the floor. Phil cried out as a bullet punched through his shoulder, and he fell down next to Mario, who was already on his stomach, hands over his head. Where's Jake? Miles cried. The captain shook his head. They shot him out of the window, he replied, motioning to the door. We need to get into the hallway. Phil! Miles crawled over to him, clamping a hand down on his friend's wound. We gotta move, then I can look at that, okay? He nodded jerkily and winced as he rolled over onto his stomach, using his good arm to drag his way along the floor. Fuck, they got Vince! Miles groaned. Phil shook his head. No, Mario got Vince, he grunted as he moved. Terrell narrowed his eyes. He fucking attacked me as soon as we got down here, Mario hissed over his shoulder as he scampered into the hallway. Vince wouldn't do that, Phil groaned, and Terrell was inclined to agree. He hadn't known this crew for very long, but he highly doubted that the terrified man had instigated anything. Miles shook his head. What happened? he asked as he helped Phil into the hallway, leaning him up against one of the walls. Terrell leapt to his feet as soon as he was clear of the office. 
double-checking the stairwell door to make sure it was secure, and then heading in the other direction to make sure there were no zombies lurking about. He fucking attacked me, Mario's voice carried down the long corridor. He was crazed. I thought he turned into one of those things. Phil let out a deep groan of pain as Terrell returned from his sweep, Miles inspecting his shoulder. Bullet went straight through, the latter said, and took off his button-down shirt, tearing it into strips. As he worked, he turned to Mario. You think Vince was bitten and didn't tell anyone? Mario shrugged. Maybe. Terrell studied his face, unconvinced. He pursed his lips as he studied the man's face, his smooth, unworried brow. It was not the face of a man mourning the death of his comrade. Either Mario had killed Vince on purpose, or he was that heartless that he didn't give a shit he was dead. Either way, the captain didn't trust him as far as he could throw him. Chapter 12 As soon as Terrell raised his mirror, Coleman was ready and watched carefully where the snipers were popping out of the other building. He fired immediately into the farthest one, catching him and sending the body tumbling down out of the window to the zombies below. He ran across the office as the other sniper fired into the windows where he'd been standing. Glass exploded everywhere, and he tried to get a read on where the main sniper was, but there was too much going on. One of the other buildings on the far side had another shooter, and Coleman ducked around the other end of the wall of windows. He peered through his scope and located that sniper, putting a bullet between his eyes. But the one Terrell needed him to get was still in that building. He was going to have to get over there. The corporal hurried back out into the hallway, knowing he needed to act fast. He peered through the small window leading into the skywalk across to the other building, but there was no movement inside. The door was miraculously unlocked, and Coleman pushed inside, hurrying past the windows to avoid detection. As he made it across into the other building, a guy's voice echoed down the hallway. Fucker's got a sniper, man, he bellowed. I think I got him, but he took out everyone but me. No, I don't know what's going on with Miles and his shits. Well, I was too busy trying not to fucking die. Coleman crept silently down the hallway, readying his handgun and his knife as he neared the office at the end. I don't know, the redneck cried into whatever device he was using to communicate with his higher-ups. I didn't know there was gonna be another sniper. He paused, grunting. Yes, sir, I'm gonna- There was a metallic clang as Coleman accidentally kicked something in the hallway, something that sounded suspiciously like a paint can. He winced and fell into a fighting stance. Shit, the redneck blurted. Somebody's here. The corporal decided that he didn't want whoever was on the other side of that line knowing what was going on and went on the offensive. He took a deep breath and dove into the room, firing his gun as he fell into a roll on the linoleum. The sniper cried out in alarm, swinging his rifle around as he took a bullet to the stomach. Coleman sprang to his feet and launched himself forward, knife flailing and the redneck raised his rifle just in time to block the corporal's arm. They wrestled for a moment, until the sniper reeled back and slammed up with the gun, catching Coleman directly in the nose. He grunted and slammed his fist into the belly wound, jabbing twice. The sniper screamed in pain and fell to one knee, and Coleman slammed his knife down into the top of the man's head. Arnie? A voice cried from the headset that had clattered to the ground in the scuffle. Shit, boss, I think they got him. The corporal slammed his boot down on the little device, smashing it to pieces. He pulled his radio from his belt and took up position in the window, surveying the area. Captain, the snipers are dealt with, he said. How's it going on your end? Chapter 13 Terrell lifted his radio to his lips. Good to hear, bud, he replied, shaking his head. We got boned coming from upstairs. There are only four of us left. Shit, Coleman came back. How's the zombie situation in there? The captain pressed his hand against the stairwell door, listening to the thundering bodies on the other side. They might have flooded the top floor, but they're still all over the stairs. We're not getting down that way. 
There are zombies fucking everywhere outside still, Coleman said. I think those trucks had a lot more in them than we originally thought. Terrell shook his head. I think we're going to have to do the same as we did upstairs, he said. What's the hostile situation on the other side of the building? You've got more zombies on one side than the other, came the reply. I can pick off some of them, but I don't know how many are in behind. Hold for now in case it gets hairy, Terrell replied. I don't want to draw anything with noise unless absolutely necessary. 10-4, Coleman said. Miles drew his bottom lip between his teeth as he finished patching up Phil. So what's the plan? The big explosion happened on the stairwell side, Terrell mused. So if we do what we did upstairs, open up the door and then barricade in an office, enough of them might flood in so that they're occupied while we jump down to the ground. Might, Mario scoffed. Terrell ignored him. It's all we've got. Coleman is going to cover us. Miles nodded. Okay, you guys get into the office. I'll do the stairwell door, and you be ready to barricade us in when I come back through, he said. You sure? The captain asked. Yeah, give you a break from being the hero, huh? Miles replied with a thin smile that seemed forced. Terrell simply nodded and helped Phil to his feet. You gonna be able to do this? He asked. The wounded man nodded, shrugging his arm out of the soldier's grip. As able as I can be, he said, and followed him back out of the hallway. Terrell got ready to shoot out the window while Mario and Phil stood ready at the door to cover Miles as he ran back in. The man in question counted down from three and then threw open the stairwell door, tearing back down the hallway full tilt towards them. As he dove inside, Phil slammed the door and Mario shoved a desk behind it as Terrell shot out the window. Automatic fire suddenly peppered the office and they all hit the deck. Cap, hostiles on the ground, Coleman cried through the radio, and then there were a few cracks as he fired on them. Terrell grunted and clicked his radio. Yeah, thanks, he replied, sarcasm evident in his tone. They've got cover, the bastards, the corporal replied. Do what you can, we're gonna try to move, Terrell informed him, and clipped the radio back to his belt. What the fuck are we gonna do, Mario demanded. Miles glanced at the office door, visibly shaking from the force of the zombies smashing into it. We can't go back that way. Terrell pulled his sidearm and handed it to Miles. We'll provide cover fire. You two get down there and get behind the cement medians off to the right. Fuck that, Mario began, but Miles grabbed his shoulder. Listen, if you won't trust him to cover you, trust me, he hissed. You get your asses down there and wait for us. Phil shimmied forward with the rope, looping it around a thick leg of the heavy steel table along the far wall. He crawled back to the window, and Terrell and Miles sat up with their backs on either side of it. The captain counted down from three, and then they turned, firing into the alcoves and areas where they'd been shot from. Phil slid down the rope, Mario hurrying behind him, and the two dove behind the cement median. Terrell nodded to Miles, who slid down as he fired, and rolled out of the way just as the enemies began to fire again. A body flopped out from behind a truck, having likely been taken out by Coleman, and the captain stayed behind the wall as more bullets peppered the office. The desk holding the door shut began to creak forward, and he groaned as the door inched open, rotting hands clawing their way into the gap. Of fucking course, he muttered, and glanced down at Miles. As his tentative new companion leaned out to fire, Terrell took his chance and flung himself from the window. He caught sight of the zombies breaking through the door just as he grasped the rope and fired wildly behind him as he slid, diving behind the cement median as soon as he hit the ground. Corpses flopped over the window ledge and smacked into the ground next to them, writhing and screaming as they tried to get to their feet. Where do we go? Phil screamed, pointing to their other side where a wall of zombies closed in. Coleman seemed to be taking some out, but it wasn't enough. They just kept coming. Terrell leapt up and smashed the window of the building's first floor, quickly checking the room before waving the wounded man forward. Bullets smacked into the wall above them, but soon enough their enemies were battling their own zombies. Miles gave Mario a boost inside, and then he and Terrell followed. 
they dragged over a nearby shelf to try to close themselves in, but it seemed the horde was passing by the window in favor of the boss's shooting lackeys. Well, genius, now we're still trapped in the same fucking building, Mario snapped. Terrell took a deep breath, trying to keep himself from shooting the asshole right there. Let's sweep this floor, see what we're dealing with. Chapter 14 Clear, Miles declared, as the quartet met back in the hallway. The stairwell, of course, was full but secure, and one of the warehouse bays had been blown apart, but the door to the main hallway was locked tight. We're stuck on the first floor now. What's it looking like out there? Terrell asked into his radio. Progress, right? Coleman replied brightly. Where you guys jump down is crawling with zombies, so going back that way is a no-go. The other side is thinner now, but I'm seeing movement of the human variety. There's at least a half dozen waiting for you down there, but the line of crates by the runway. Wonderful, Terrell replied. He peeked through the slats in one of the conference rooms and noted a small outbuilding kitty corner to the building. He raised the radio again. There's a maintenance building outside. If I could get to that, then it would only be a 30-yard sprint to catch the guys behind those crates. You think you could distract them enough? Oh, you know me, Cap, big old distraction. The corporal came back. Just say the word. Terrell nodded. Be ready, he said, and then returned the radio to his belt. He turned and motioned to the open broom closet at the far end of the room. Hey, Miles, how much ammo you have left? None, his companion replied, pulling the mag from Terrell's handgun. The captain pulled out a broom, breaking the handle over his knee. Run into one of those offices, see if there's black permanent marker. What the? Mario threw his hands up as Miles hurried back out into the hallway. Terrell broke another broomstick. Miles and I are going to make a run for that outbuilding, take cover, and then flank the rednecks on the runway, he explained. You and Phil are gonna provide decoy cover. Decoy cover? Mario snapped. What the fuck is decoy cover? We don't have any guns, so you two will be in the window on the other corner of the building, making them think we do, Terrell said, as Miles returned with a handful of markers. Smart idea, he said pulling the cap off of one with his teeth and handing the rest to the captain. Mario shook his head. No, the smart idea would be giving us that rifle on your shoulder so we could provide actual cover. Terrell paused, weighing how he wanted to respond to that. He still didn't trust this asshole. And for sure, he wasn't about to give him their only gun. But he was tired of this power struggle. We're gonna need it more than you, Miles cut in saving Terrell the trouble of answering. He handed the blackened handle out to his annoyed comrade, and Mario snatched it from him in a huff. Phil took the other one, giving the captain a salute. We'll cover you as best we can, he said, cracking a half smile through the pain in his shoulder. Thanks, Terrell replied with a smile of encouragement. Miles rifled around in the broom closet and emerged with a screwdriver. I guess this is as good as it's going to get for me, he said with a good-natured shrug. Okay, you two get into position, and once we're clear, wait for us to come around and pick you up, Terrell instructed. The zombies will probably end up circling around to your end of the building, so stay put until we come for you. Phil nodded. I ain't making a run for it through those things, he assured him. Mario simply grunted as they headed off to their post. Terrell peeked through the blinds again. You ready? He asked. As ready as I'm gonna be, Miles replied, tightening his fist around the screwdriver. The captain raised his radio to his lips. Distraction time, corporal. Chapter 15 Terrell gently slid the window open and punched out the screen, and waited a beat before Coleman fired. He leapt out, tearing for the maintenance building. Miles hot on his heels. He peered over at the window where Mario and Phil stood, silhouettes ducking up and down with their broom handles, looking enough like rifles to be intimidating. The captain peeked around the corner and saw a row of rednecks in various stages of plaid, firing up at Coleman's position with automatic weapons. Let's go, he hissed to Miles and then took off like a shot. 
Zombies began to mill around the building, staggering and tripping over each other on their way towards the runway, and the hillbillies focused on the horde mostly, taking cover from Coleman's sporadic fire. Terrell reached them first, leaping down on the closest guy and smashing the butt of his rifle into his face. The guy screamed in surprise, kicking out the captain's ankles and dropping him to the ground. He rolled and gripped the barrel of the redneck's gun, jammed it up into his chin, and then launched himself on top, sending them rolling to the side into a pile of crates. A snarl and snap sounded just above his head, and Terrell flopped out of the way to allow for the zombie to descend on his enemy's face. Miles jabbed a few times into one man's throat, kicking him in the stomach until he doubled over and grabbing the butt of his hunting rifle. Another guy swung at Miles from behind, but Terrell launched himself at him, slamming them down to the asphalt. Miles grappled with his opponent, spinning him around and throwing him over the crates into a trio of waiting zombies to devour. Terrell slammed the redneck's face into the ground a few times and picked up his rifle, firing once into the fallen man's head and then again at one of the remaining rednecks that aimed at Miles. The final hillbilly jumped up on top of a crate and raised his gun with a loud yell, but then his head exploded with the force of a bullet from Coleman's vantage point. Miles and Terrell grabbed all of the fallen hunting rifles that had scattered with their prey and turned to make a beeline back to Mario and Phil. The captain had just enough time to notice that their window had been blasted right through before six more rednecks came around the corner. Motherfucker! Miles exclaimed before clenching his jaw and diving back behind the crates. Terrell joined him, cocking one of the rifles. As soon as we fire on them, we're fucked, he said. But if we don't, we're fucked, Miles added. The snarls from the zombies milling about on the other side of the crates solidified that theory. The captain nodded. Yep. Miles cocked one of the rifles he'd retrieved. Ready when you are. Terrell popped up from behind the crates, managing to take advantage of the element of surprise and take out one of the rednecks. He ducked back down as the other five opened fire, drawing the attention of the nearby zombies. Miles fired through the slats in one of the crates, but his jaw dropped as a truck skidded around the corner. A plaid-laden man with a gigantic gut, manning a mounted machine gun on the back. The duo scattered in opposite directions as the machine gun tore the crates to smithereens, making it out of the way just in time, as wood splinters exploded everywhere. Terrell pressed himself flat against a little outbuilding, looking over to see miles behind a few dumpsters as cover. The captain looked up to Coleman's window, hoping to hell that his friend was still alive, and as if on cue, the corporal fired on the truck. The redneck swung around, bringing the mounted barrel to face the building. But Coleman was faster, putting a bullet right into his face. The rotund hillbilly flopped backwards in the truck bed, one arm still hanging off of the gun. Terrell rushed forward, launching himself off of a legless zombie up onto the back of the truck. One of the other rednecks clambered up after him, but he smashed them in the face with the butt of the rifle he held. The driver floored it, swerving to try to shake him off, but Miles dove out from behind his dumpster and fired at the windshield a few times. He managed to hit something, because Terrell had to brace himself on the fat corpse to keep from hurtling off of the truck as it sideswiped a building. He swung the gun around and fired into the remaining enemies, taking them down even in their futile attempt to dive away. Miles ran for the truck, throwing open the driver's side door and jumping inside. Terrell pulled his radio up to his mouth. Meet us at the south side of that building, Coleman, stat, he yelled, and then dropped the mouthpiece as he took out more of the horde. The gun was useful, but it was also noisy as all hell, which wasn't helping their situation any. Miles skidded to a stop next to the window where Mario and Phil had been decoys, but only the former hopped outside. Where's Phil? Miles demanded as Mario dove into the passenger's seat. He shook his head. They got him, he said. Fuck, Miles cursed and floored the gas. Terrell narrowed his eyes, sure that as they sped away, he saw blood staining the broken end of a fallen broomstick on the floor through the window. But he had to focus. 
he stopped firing on the horde as they began to put some distance between them, opting instead to scan around to make sure that none of the boss's lackeys were still hanging about. He didn't know if the twelve or so that he and Miles had taken out had been all the backup that was coming, or if there were just going to be more waves of hillbillies. They screamed around to the south side, and Coleman came tearing out of the side door, clambering up into the truck bed next to the captain. That was fucking close, he said. Terrell clapped him on the shoulder. It really was. Where are we going? Miles called back through the window as he pulled away from the base. The captain smacked the roof of the truck. I think it's time you came back to chat with Xavier. Chapter 16 The men at the gate seemed impressed and taken aback by the massive gun on the back of the truck. Terrell beckoned for Miles and Mario to come out. Rifles in the cab, boys, the captain said, as Mario tried to snag a rifle from Miles' stash he'd procured. Miles nodded and unslung the one from his shoulder, tossing it into the back seat. Understood. Mario scowled. Not understood. What's going to stop you from just killing us once we get inside? One measly rifle on your back isn't, that's for sure, Coleman replied brightly. The annoyed-looking man thrust the gun into one of the guard's unsuspecting hands and moved to stand behind Miles petulantly. Go ahead and take this baby to the garage, Terrell said to the guard, motioning to the truck. Xavier can decide if he wants to keep it like this or mount the gun on the wall. The guard nodded and got behind the wheel, heading inside. Well, do we get to go inside? Mario demanded, motioning to the door. Terrell motioned to a little lean-to on the outer wall that served as the compound's lobby. We need to go over a few things first. He waved for them to come over. Have a seat. Coleman pulled out two wooden chairs, patting both men heartily on the back as they sat in them. The corporal then leaned against the wall off to the side, inspecting his fingernails as Terrell pulled a book from the shelf behind him. He slammed it down on the table in front of the men, both of them visibly jumping from the noise. Can you read? He demanded. Miles raised an eyebrow and stared down at the cover of the book. Medieval torture techniques? He asked. Terrell nodded and slid the book towards Mario, flipping it open. Pick a page, he urged. Mario wrinkled his nose, flipping a few pages and shoving the book back. Ah, the saw technique, the captain said. Coleman clucked his tongue. Good choice. The subject is strung up from his ankles in a V formation, Terrell read, pacing back and forth as he held the book in his hands. And then a gigantic saw is passed through the opening at the apex of the thighs. Two people begin to saw back and forth from the genitals down through the body until the subject is rend in two. Miles and Mario both stared at him, faces pale. He slapped the book shut and stared down at them, brow stern. And since this ain't fucking medieval times, we'll saw just enough to get the blood flowing and leave you strung up for the zombies to take chunks out of. We're distinguished modern men, Coleman added, not looking up from his nails. Terrell slid the book back onto its shelf. Of course, you don't have to worry about any of this if you're loyal to the town. He glared down at Mario, noting the sweat on his brow. What do you think? Miles took a deep breath. Dude, you don't have to worry about us he said. Definitely don't need to be sawing my dick in half. And you? Terrell stared down his nose at Mario. I saw Phil. He didn't get shot. Mario leapt from his chair, the wood clattering to the ground, and took off down a side street. Miles shook his head, jaw dropped. He raised his hands. The guy was an asshole, but I swear I didn't know he was- It's cool, man, I know, Terrell said, clapping him on the shoulder. You've been genuine, and you had my back out there. Come on. Miles got to his feet, shaking his head. If you knew about Mario, why didn't you kill him? He asked, as they walked to the front gate. After all that talk of sawing. Oh, the sawing still applies, Coleman assured him as they strolled. So you'd better stay loyal. Terrell nodded. We've got other plans for Mario, he said and the corporal wiggled a little console from his pocket. He flicked it on, and a red light immediately began to flicker on a small screen. You planted a tracker on him, 
Miles breathed, shaking his head in awe. You guys are hardcore. Yep, Coleman replied, puffing out his chest. Terrell chuckled, shaking his head. We figured your information might be dated, since the boss knows that you defected and can't be sure what Xavier knows. So having Mario lead us to him will give us a better lay of the land for future. Good call, Miles agreed. Xavier headed out of town hall, pursing his lips as he took in the two soldiers and their friend. Mr. Miles, he greeted. You've always been cordial in our dealings. Looks like that paid off for you. Apparently so, sir, he replied, extending his hand to shake. The older man took it, offering a smile. If you've been vetted by these two, then welcome. We're always needing some strong hands around here. I can help with that, Miles said, and cracked his knuckles. Coleman raised his nose. Something smells fried. Xavier chuckled and shook his head. Nothing gets past you, Corporal. June's got some fried chicken plated just for you boys. Fried chicken? Miles asked, incredulously. Coleman pumped a fist into the air. I fucking love this place. Language, young man, Ruth scolded as they entered the hall. Coleman blushed. Apologies, ma'am, he mumbled, and she nodded at him as she set cups of coffee down on the conference table. Miles looked flabbergasted as he took a seat at the long table in front of a steaming plate of fried chicken and mashed root vegetables and a hot coffee. You're an angel, he said, and June trilled a laugh, patting him on the shoulder before heading back into the kitchen. So where are we on the Fayetteville distraction? Xavier asked as he raised a mug of coffee to his lips. Terrell leaned back in his chair with his own mug. We've got a detonation device, but nothing to make it explode. We need chemicals. I hope you have something big, Miles put in. The boss has a battle force of 500 men at least. He's got military-grade hardware, not to mention all of the weapons from that cache we tried to get to you. Coleman spit bits of chicken as he shook his head. 500 men? He blurted around his food. Terrell flicked a hunk of meat from his sleeve with distaste. How many men doesn't matter? It's the zombies that matter and we need to make a big enough explosion to draw them away from here. Back on one of the farms I used to work at, there's a stash of nitrate we can use, Xavier said. At least it should still be there. If we can get our hands on ammonia, then that should do it for the bomb. Any word from the scouts on where we could find that? Terrell asked. Xavier shook his head. No, but I can make sure they know to look for it. Better to have the supplies sooner rather than later, the captain replied and received a nod in return. Walter, Xavier called as the young man headed through the lobby. Could you get some intel to the scouts, please? Sure thing, sir, Walter replied, and followed the older man over to a back table where they could work out the messages to send out. No rest for the wicked, huh? Coleman asked as he leaned back in his chair and let out a loud belch. Terrell eyed his empty plate with a raised eyebrow. Not with the way you eat. Man, you'd better eat yours or I'm gonna, the corporal replied. It's delicious and I worked up an appetite saving your ass a bunch of times today. Miles chuckled through a mouthful of chicken at the two soldiers. Terrell shook his head and pulled his plate away from his comrade. Your reward for saving my ass was a ride home. Thank you and you're welcome. He glanced over at Miles. Well, what do you think? You ready to run with us? Their new recruit nodded, swallowing his mouthful. I'll help however I can. Fuck, I wish we'd have gotten those weapons, Coleman lamented. Terrell shrugged. Well, we got some rifles and that sweet machine gun. True, the corporal replied. Terrell grinned. And we get to build a giant bomb. Hell yes, Coleman agreed. Let's go blow shit up. Chapter 17 Meanwhile, at the Charlotte Fortress, Captain Frank Kyle strained against the weights, eking out a few last reps before his body gave up for the day. He shoved up one more before heaving the bar up with a crash and sitting up to grab his water bottle. He took a swig and wiped his sweaty face with a towel, chest heaving. The doors to the gym opened, and two middle-aged, overweight men sauntered in. Frank raised an eyebrow 
as he sized up their grease-stained jeans and cautious gait. How's it going, fellas? he asked. What can I do for you? They glanced at each other, motioning for the other to speak. After a momentary silent parley, the taller of the two stepped forward. Excuse me, Mr. Army Man, he said, southern accent thick as molasses. We're real sorry for interrupting your workout, but we's wondering if you could help us out. The captain shrugged and slung his towel over his shoulder. I'll see what I can do, and please call me Frank. And who might you be? My name's Kenny, sir, and this is my lifelong friend Zane, the tall man replied and motioned to his shorter companion. Frank extended his hand to shake each of them in turn. It's a pleasure to meet the two of you. If you don't mind me asking, and please don't take offense to the question, but how did you two find your way into our little fortress here? Forgive me, but y'all don't really strike me as the scientist or farmer types. No offense taken, Mr. Frank, Kenny replied politely. The captain smiled and put up a hand. Please, just Frank. Okay, Frank, the tall man nodded. Well, you see, when this stuff started going down, Zane and me were up at our junk pit. Frank raised an eyebrow. Junk pit? Yeah, it's like a car junkyard, except we'd taken anything and everything we thought we could repurpose, Kenny explained. Refrigerators from the 50s, wrought iron fences, and hell, I'm pretty sure we even had some old rail lines they tore up to put in a mini mall. Frank nodded, impressed. Y'all must have been pretty good at what you do in order to get an invite here. Oh, yes, sir, we was the best demolition derby car builders on the East Coast. Zane piped up, nodding emphatically. People feared us at every dirt track from here to Milton, Florida. Our driver Jimbo would drive that big bitch of a car and just tear through them other buggers like a hot knife through gravy. Ain't lost a derby in damn near six years. Kenny wrinkled his nose. Except that one in Valdosta. Man, you know that don't count on accounting that we got disqualified for being too shit-kicking awesome. Zane wagged his finger. You see, Frank, that was the race we debuted the behemoth. Named after Zane's wife, Kenny cut in. His friend laughed. Not sure why you getting salty. She was your wife first. Frank scrubbed his hands down his face, trying to hide his sly smile. Anywho, we beat them suckers down so quick that the crowd started booing and throwing beer onto the infield. Zane continued. Promoter got pissed and DQ'd us to keep the peace. The captain nodded. Okay, I'm starting to see why Bill picked you boys. Sounds like if I need a death mobile, you'll be up to the task. Oh, yes, sir, Frank. We got you covered, buddy, Kenny said with a little salute. Frank took a deep breath. Well, fellas, I got a lot on my plate today, so what is it I can help you out with? We was wondering if we could have one of them dumbbells, the tall man said. The captain took a swig of his water and shrugged. I mean, this gym is open to everyone, so you boys are more than welcome to work out any time you like. You don't have to ask my permission. The duo burst out laughing, full out slapping their knees. Kenny held his belly and wiped a tear from his eye. Boy, that's a good one, Frank. Ain't neither one of us ever done anything close to working out in our lives. Except that one time when we were on that mission trip to Nigeria, Zane countered. The taller man shook his head. It was Niger. Nigeria, the shorter man exclaimed. Niger, Kenny growled. Zane clapped his hands and barked. It was Nigeria. Boy, you need to go back to school and learn geology so you can be smart like me. Frank scrubbed his hands down his face again, this time trying to keep his sanity intact. Anyways, the shorter man continued, turning towards their seated audience. We was on this mission trip when this little hottie, Sally Mae Hutchinson, offered to give Kenny here an adult wet willy, if you know what I mean, provided he could prove his worth by leaping over a creek. Well, try as he might, old Kenny here was waist deep in water you wouldn't want to be within 20 feet of. If I live to be a 100, I'll never laugh that hard again. Frank stifled a chuckle, rubbing his chin. Okay, fellas, so if you don't want to work out, then what do you need the dumbbell for? Well, Frank, we had us a little brainstorming session. Kenny tapped his temple. We came up with something that might help clear out some of them critters outside. Don't know if it's gonna work or not, but we want to give it a shot. Frank shrugged. What the hell? If nothing else, it'll be a good opportunity to see what you boys can do. 
Take what you need. The duo turned their backs on him, whispering to each other in a private conference. Every once in a while they would break to point at a few things, and then seem to settle on a ten-pounder. All right, Frank, give us about a half hour or so, then come up to section 232 and we'll show you what we've got, Kenny declared. The captain nodded with a tired smile on his face. Looking forward to it, fellas. He chuckled as they headed out with their dumbbell, and before the door even closed, Bill Huff entered. Hey, Bill, I was just coming to find you. Looks like I wasn't the only one, the older man replied, and motioned over his shoulder with his thumb. They're a couple of special ones, aren't they? Frank barked a laugh before standing up and heading over. Understatement of the day. I wouldn't underestimate them, though. They're the best at what they do, Bill said. The captain nodded as he removed the towel from his shoulder. I don't doubt it. If you're done with your workout, you want to follow me up to section 210? The older man asked. Freeman and the team should be back any minute. Frank shoved the towel and water bottle in his duffel bag and zipped it up before holding the door open. Mission go well? He asked as he motioned for Bill to go first. I'll let him fill you in, the older man explained. But I have some stuff I need to cover with you first. They strolled down the long corridor, various military and civilians wandering around them. How are things looking? Frank asked. Bill took a deep breath. The living quarters are almost completely set up and should be finished by the end of the day tomorrow, he said. There were some power fluctuations in the last area we were setting up that delayed things. Anything we should worry about? Frank's brow furrowed. Nah, turns out someone had just stumbled over a cable leading to some of the solar panels, and the connector came loose. Bill waved him off, plugged it back in, and we were good to go. The captain sighed in relief. Simple fixes are good, especially given our limited supplies, the older man added. Speaking of, Frank raised his chin. How's our food supply looking? More than enough to go around, Bill spread his hands. Just got word that we are getting some tomato sprouts popping up in some of the greenhouses. We're still about a month away from having fresh salads, but we're on the right path. They reached the elevator just as the doors opened, and a few soldiers filed out, saluting the captain. He responded in kind, and put out his hand to hold the doors open for Bill. How are we looking on the research facilities? He asked. We're as good as we're gonna get for the moment, Bill replied. We are short on equipment, and there really isn't a good way to improve the situation. We have some of the civilians keeping an eye out for what we need, but not a lot of scientific equipment being stashed in office buildings. Frank pursed his lips as he punched the buttons on the elevator. Make sure it's stressed to them that our help isn't contingent on how much equipment they find for us. Last thing we need is for one of them to get eaten and the rest of them picking up arms against us. There's enough of that going around as it is. Bill shook his head. The elevator gave a happier ding than their mood, and Frank shook his head. And I have no doubt if anything happened on this trip, Freeman will make sure I never hear the end of it. The doors opened, and they walked into the hallway towards the open railing. The sun reflected off of the glass buildings along the skyline, splashing beautiful colors everywhere in an almost peaceful way. But as they gazed down at the ground, there was a sea of undead, filling every square inch of space from the stadium all the way back as far as the eye could see. You'd think with all the threats that are facing us, the people would be coming together instead of trying to kill us, Frank said with a sigh as he tuned out the raw hum of dead groans. We've got the undead around every corner. Lots of people in the city are facing starvation. And I can't imagine how people trapped in office buildings are dealing with the constant boredom. We at least have some things set up to keep us occupied in the stadium. But there's only so many paper clips you can throw into a styrofoam cup before you snap. Bill nodded thoughtfully as the zombies below parted around Freeman's transport vehicle, slowly moving through the horde. I'll see if I can't round up some entertainment options for our city dweller friends. Pretty sure we can spare a football or two at the very least. Thanks, Bill, Frank replied, and then pressed his lips into a thin line. They watched in silence as Freeman closed in on the stadium wall. 
a small team of soldiers headed by them towards the landing zone with ladders, refreshments, and medical gear. Has there been any word from Terrell? Frank finally asked the question that had been weighing on his mind. Bill shook his head sadly. I'm sorry, there's been no word from him. Well, I guess no news is good news, the captain said, crossing his arms. At least we haven't gotten word of his demise. The older man nodded. From what you've told me about him, it's going to take a lot more than the zombie apocalypse to take him out. This is true, Frank chuckled. He winced at the sound of Freeman's truck scraping loudly against the side of the stadium with a metallic screech. He's graceful, ain't he? Luckily, we have some good body shop guys on staff here, Bill agreed. As his companion made to head over to the ladders, he grasped his shoulder to stop him. There's one more thing, Captain, and if I'm going to be perfectly honest, I think it should stay just between the two of us. Frank's brow furrowed, and he turned, leaning in close. This can't be good, he murmured. Well, it doesn't really change our immediate situation, but could demoralize people if they learn of it, dramatically changing our situation here, Bill said, taking a deep breath. Frank's heart pounded. What has you worried, Bill? I talked to John Tita this morning, the older man said. Our scheduled call wasn't for a couple more days, but he reached out directly to me. They made the decision a couple of days ago to isolate the East Coast from the rest of the country. The captain's jaw dropped. Isolate the East Coast? He hissed. How the hell do you do that without blowing up every bridge on the Mississippi River? Well, Bill chewed his lip for a moment. You don't. Frank's eyes widened. Fucking hell. I mean, yeah, it makes sense from a strategic point of view. Sacrifice the East Coast so you have a chance to save the rest of the country. He puffed out his cheeks and shook his head. Still, it's a kick in the dick to know we're being abandoned. For what it's worth, John did tell me that they aren't abandoning us, Bill said quickly. They've left up a handful of rural bridges so they can still get supplies across to survivor settlements. Although he did admit he doesn't have a timeline for that, since they're deep in the planning stages for the Northwest invasion. Frank nodded. Seattle? Yep, Bill confirmed. The captain rubbed his forehead. Another smart move. Got everything you could possibly need up there. Agreed, the older man said. Frank sighed. Well, that does give me hope that the leadership positions are still filled with competent people. We might just win this thing yet. One day, my friend, Bill clapped him on the shoulder. In the meantime, I still have about 40 things on my list that I was supposed to get done before talking with you. The captain offered him a smile. No worries, Bill. I should be getting over to the landing zone anyway. If I don't greet Freeman when he gets off the transport, he'll pout. They shared a chuckle and then parted ways. Frank reached the landing zone just as Gardner began dumping a bottle of water on his face to try to clear himself of the coagulated blood caked on him. You okay there, Gardner? The captain asked. The younger man shook his head like a dog, splattering his three companions in pink liquid. Another goddamn zombie bukkake, Captain. He threw his hands up. None of these other motherfuckers have a drop on them. Hell, none of them even had to fight one except me. Frank leaned in. But you're not hurt, though, right? Gardner wiped his face with a towel and then tossed it aside, shaking his head. Nah, just pissed the fuck off, Captain. His superior nodded and squeezed his shoulder. We'll take the rest of your shift off and go hit the showers. I think we can handle it the rest of the way. Much appreciated, Captain, Gardner replied, his whole body relaxing with the offer. He didn't waste any time heading off, leaving Webb, Bennett, and Foster staring after him with varying expressions. Freeman, don't think I don't know you're looking at my ass as I climb up, Marie declared as she crested the railing. Freeman's signature laugh echoed up to them. I was just being polite, you know, ladies first and all. Yeah, forgive me if I don't buy that bullshit excuse, Marie shot back as she hopped off of the ladder, crossing her arms. Frank approached the railing. If I may play devil's advocate for a moment, 
he said as Freeman's head popped up. Marie, he very well could be allowing you to go first to be polite. Sure, he may be checking out your ass as y'all climb, but he's sparing you from having to stare at his. She put a finger to her chin in mock thought, and then let out a playful shudder before laughing. I can see why they made you captain. Out of the box thinking comes in handy. She punched Freeman in the bicep before walking backwards towards the trio of onlookers. I may have bought the latter excuse, but that's not going to work as I walk away. Eyes front, boys. She shot Freeman a wink and then turned, heading off with the others to shed their gear. He blew her a sly kiss and smirked. Frank blinked at his friend in disbelief. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were smitten. Can you blame me? Freeman shot back. Look at her. I said eyes front, boys. She barked over her shoulder in the distance. The two men shared a laugh, and Frank clapped his friend on the back as they turned back towards the railing, leaning against it over the mass of moaning, rotting flesh below. So how'd it go out there? This trip was about as good as we could have hoped for, Freeman replied casually. We got five more floors secured in Wayne's building. Two, maybe three more runs, and we should have everything but the lobby secured. Frank raised an eyebrow. Clusterfuck? Understatement, his friend confirmed. Half the doors are unlocked, and someone drove a car through one of the glass walls. We have the doors and the staircases to the lobby barricaded, so nothing is getting through there without high explosives. The captain let out a low whistle. Here's hoping that our rowdy neighbors are fresh out of those. Ain't that the fucking truth? Freeman agreed, and they bumped fists. You have any issues with them this trip? Frank asked. His subordinate shook his head. Nah, they kept to themselves. We spotted a couple of their snipers in the windows of the building on the corner of Third and Tryon, but no shots fired. Third and Tryon? The captain asked, eyes widening in surprise. What the hell were y'all doing down that far? Wayne made contact with another group that was out for our blood. Freeman explained, but was able to convince them to join his group rather than fight against us. Problem was, they had a few people who weren't really in any condition to move, so we had to go get them. They were packed up and ready to go on the second floor, so all we had to do was grab them, kind of like a drive through but for people. It was a calculated risk, but a risk nonetheless, the captain said. His friend nodded. Oh, I agree but I figured the less people we have out there trying to kill us, the better. Did you get a list of the people you brought over? Frank asked. Freeman motioned back over his shoulder with his thumb. Yeah, Marie took down a list of names of everybody in the new group. Claimed it was for medical reasons, so they wouldn't get suspicious. Good thinking, the captain commended. You know I'm not the paranoid type, but it seems a little too convenient for you guys not to take any fire from those assholes. Yeah, seeing them in the windows watching us work. Freeman pursed his lips in thought. Just fucking eerie, like they know a storm is coming and don't want to waste any energy. Frank shook his head. I hope you're wrong, but I'm afraid you might be right. As they stood there, solemnly contemplating the coming war, somebody yelled, Yeehaw! from down the hallway. What in the country fried fuck was that? Freeman demanded, turning around in surprise. Frank turned around, resting his elbows on the railing. Oh yeah, that should be my new friends, Zane and Kenny. It's not like you to make friends, his subordinate teased. The captain shot him a wry grin. Eh, figure I'm trapped in a football stadium, so gotta try something new to keep the boredom at bay, right? He shrugged. Come on, this might be entertaining. Freeman shook his head but couldn't deny the curiosity as he followed his friend down the hallway to the excited hooting and hollering. As they rounded the bend, the two demolition experts were standing against the railing, looking outside. Kenny turned the handle on a giant wheel housing a long chain, the base bolted to the concrete floor. All right, slow her up there, Zane said, waving at his companion. He reached over the edge and grabbed the chain, pulling up the end where they'd welded the dumbbell. It was covered in blood and bone, and the redneck flicked the bits off with a gloved hand. Freeman wrinkled his nose. New friends, huh? Well, looks like I was right about the entertaining part, Frank quipped. 
What do you say, boys? He called as they approached. Oh, hey, Frank, Zane greeted. You should have been here 30 seconds ago. You missed a humdinger of a toss. The captain scratched the back of his head. Apparently, I'm missing quite a bit, because I have no idea what you boys are thinking. Well, you see, me and Zane were down in the shop working on reinforcing some of them vehicles when we got to talking about how much we missed fishing, Kenny began. His short friend nodded emphatically. Yeah, just the simple joy of a man casting his rod into the water while getting shit-faced on cheap-ass beer, he added wistfully. No better time in a man's life than when he's fishing. See, as we was reminiscing about them good times, Zane found this here spool of chain, and it got us thinking. Kenny continued. Well, we can't get the cheap-ass beer. We can still cast that rod and hook us a big one. Freeman shared a glance with Frank and then barked a laugh. Fucking love your new friends. He approached the wall. All right, cast away. Let's see if you can reel one in. Zane excitedly leaned over the railing and looked for a target. He wound his arm back and whipped the dumbbell out into the air. It dragged the chain behind it, falling in an impressive arc before thunking down onto a zombie's head. The demolition men shared a victorious yell and high-fived as the corpse in the tattered business suit crumpled to the asphalt. Goddamn, did you see that sucker's head go? Zane exclaimed, blowing a raspberry to accentuate the splat. Boy, that's two straight headshots, woo! Kenny furrowed his brow. What you talking about? You didn't get that last one in the head? Bullshit, I didn't, Zane snapped. His tall friend shook his head. You took his ear off and hit his shoulder, that don't count. I may be an eighth grade dropout, but even I know that ears are connected to heads, Zane shot back. Kenny threw up his hands. You know what I mean, a headshot's gotta kill him, not go all Vincent Van Gogh on him. Freeman leaned over to say into Frank's ear. I'll admit, I didn't expect that reference. The captain stayed quiet, arms crossed, looking contemplative as the hillbillies bickered back and forth. They finally realized the silence of their companion and turned towards him. Uh, Frank? Kenny asked nervously. What, what do you think? The captain raised his chin. I think if we're going to do this, then we're going to do it right. The other three blinked at him, confused. I'm sorry, I don't understand, Zane admitted. Freeman raised an eyebrow. Yeah, I'm a little unsure of what you mean myself. Well, you two were just arguing over what constituted a headshot, which is something we're going to need to codify, Frank explained, receiving two blank stares in return. What I mean is, we need to come up with rules so that we know how to properly give points on the throws. Because in my view, if anything is worth doing, it's worth competing in. The hillbillies hooted and high-fived each other, doing a celebratory jig that looked hilarious done by overweight rednecks. You want to have a competitive zombie killing league? Freeman gaped. Frank shrugged. Why not? Well, with such a compelling argument like that, how can I say no? His friend rolled his eyes. Freeman, we have to find ways to keep morale up and people engaged, the captain explained. The reality is that we may be here for years, and if we don't keep spirits high, it won't be a good situation. How many people have we lost over the years when they've lost hope? Okay, I'm with you, Cap, Freeman replied, nodding his agreement. Frank turned towards the dynamic duo. You did some good work here, boys. You feel like doing a little bit more? Sure thing, Frank, whatever you need. Zane even saluted in his excitement. There any more of those spindles down there? The captain asked. Kenny cocked his head. I could be mistaken, but I think there were two or three more hiding down there. If you boys don't mind making up a couple more of them, Freeman here will find a good spot to set them up. Frank motioned to his friend. In the meantime, I'll start drafting up the official rule book and getting a few volunteers to be referees. Referees? Kenny wrinkled his nose. What we need them for? The captain crossed his arms. To keep everybody in line and to make it a fair competition. If we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it right. Zane raised his hand like a child in the classroom, reaching so high his shirt rose up over his bulbous belly. Frank chuckled. Yes, Zane? 
I don't know if they got him here or not, or if we have anybody to run him. But man, it would kick ass if we could get some of them cameras they used to broadcast the football games to use on this, he said earnestly. Jumbotron zombie kills? Freeman guffawed. I'm in. Frank grinned, shaking his head. I'll see what I can do. Zane and Kenny let out loud whoops and high-fived again, turning to head away. One more thing, the captain said, raising a hand to accentuate his point. And this is non-negotiable. Everybody who participates wears protective gear. Goggles, gloves, the works. After every turn, they are monitored by the docks. And if they come down with so much as a sniffle, they're in quarantine for a week. Safety comes first, is that clear? The duo gulped and nodded solemnly. Good deal, Frank said, clapping his hands. You boys get to work. The boys scurried off down the hallway, whispering excitedly. Two weeks ago, we were running missions in some godforsaken third world shithole, Freeman said, voice laced with awe. Now you're the commissioner of the world's very first competitive zombie killing league. Frank chuckled. Yeah, I'd be lying if I said I had that on my list of possibilities. For what it's worth, you're doing good work, Cap, Freeman said, all humor gone from his face. You're keeping us safe, keeping us fed, and taking care of shit I wouldn't even think to notice. The captain smiled warmly. I appreciate that. He took a deep breath, and the two let their thoughts sink in for a moment. Hey, don't worry about picking out the spots for the new rigs. I'll take care of that. You go get out of your gear and get some rest. You sure, Cap? Freeman asked. I don't mind. Frank waved him off. Nah, I got it. Need some time to think anyway. His friend's gaze softened, and he took a deep breath, extending his fist. Frank, if you need anything. I know where to find you, the captain finished, and bumped it with a smile. He watched Freeman saunter off and inspected the chain wheel. He put on a pair of gloves and picked up the dumbbell, turning it over in his hands. Zombie League Commissioner, that's something for the resume, all right. But it's what we need to do to keep the morale high. He wound up his arm. To keep people engaged. He lobbed the weight out over the zombie heads. To keep the dangerous boredom away. His thoughts trailed off as the weight smashed into the face of a young female corpse, caving in her skull and dropping her whole body to the ground. The captain smiled, proud of himself, and then shook his head at the absurdity of the situation. To keep away the dangerous boredom. End of book seven. Coming soon. The action shifts back to El Paso as the survivors in Fabens branch out in search of necessities while running into some new yet familiar faces.